There's days where are we actually wasting everybody's time? Are we frauds? Can electrostatic approaches to fusion have a pathway to net energy? You know, people getting in like, ah, this is bonkers. It's so hard because fusion, we're taking something that doesn't work and we're trying to make it work. No one knows the answer. That voice on the side of your head that says that you're not good enough, you can't do this. Like you guys are wasting everybody's time. Our experiments are starting to lose faith that they're gonna be able to produce something that we want. We are not going to finish what we said we were gonna do in the Series A. In fact, we don't even have a working fusion machine. Stress, anxiety, what are we gonna do? And I didn't have a plan. And then at the same time, Jesus showed up and was like, do you know about these Russian experiments from the 1980s and 1990s? You know, this is something that we need to look back because this is exactly what we're looking for. You're like, this matches this. And so for me, that was like a, oh my God, I think we have the experimental basis, the theoretical basis, to pivot to this thing. We're gonna go tackle this grand engineering challenge to build something nobody's built, to do something nobody's done yet. And my wife was like, okay, I want to make sure we got good insurance and I want a company hoodie. I started working at Blue Origin in 2014. That's where I met Bryant. We were the first 10 people working on the New Glenn reusable rocket. I realized working on that program was how hard this vision of millions of people living and working in space was going to be with just chemical rockets. And then if you're talking about getting millions of people into space and having this like whole space economy, like how is that ever going to work with chemical rockets and all of the limitations there? So it became really clear to me that at some point someone was gonna to have to do nuclear. And there's all these problems with fission and launching a fission reactor. And so that meant it had to be fusion. And told Brian circa 2018, I wanna do a fusion startup. And so I was like, man, I wanna be a part of that. I wanna do my best to take a big swing at the big problem. And energy abundance and fusion seem to be the ways to go about that. Nuclear fusion is the thing that powers everything, that gives energy to life on Earth, that comes from the sun. Um, essentially, you're taking two small atoms and you're really heavy pressure, you're forcing them together, and it emits a lot of energy. And so when we looked at the different architectures out there, they were huge. And that makes it very, very hard to experiment. It makes it hard to pivot when you learn something new. You gotta build the thing, it takes a long time. You gotta test the thing, you gotta learn from it, you gotta revise your theories. This is, just has to be small. It needs to be small for those rapid iterations, but it needs to be small for the economics. I want this to be smaller than my Toyota Tundra. Let's explore how to do that. What is the limitation? So that was really the original conversation. So there's a bunch of different ways to do fusion, right? They're called confinement schemes. You have the tokamaks, the most mainstream approach to fusion. Behind that, you have the stellarators, you have laser fusion, and then you have some more niche stuff, starting with magnetic mirrors, where you have two magnets and you try and confine the plasma magnetically. And then you have electrostatic fusion, where instead of using magnetic fields, you're trying to use high voltage to confine the ions and heat the ions. I see it kind of like early aviation. You look at it, you got all these different wings. You got big wings, you got multiple small wings, you got stagger wings. There's a bunch of different configurations that can make you fly. And so we were finding what are the different tools for manipulating ions to fuse them that we could get small. And one of the reasons they get big is to get the heating from the fusion products. And that means a big device to hold as dense and big of a plasma as you can get away with. And we said, all right, we've got to have a very efficient way of heating it. And uh, we looked at electrostatic, like using high voltages. You can get a really, really strong force on these ions. And there's something called electrostatic heating, and it looked wildly efficient. Who said, if you could mix in electrons in there and co-confine them, we'd have something really interesting. We magnetically confine electrons, like a magnetron in your microwave, and we electrostatically confine the ions. And so the thesis of Avalanche is like, can we operate in between purely electrostatic and purely magnetic and use aspects of both to try and ameliorate the cons of both? Can electrostatic approaches to fusion have a pathway to net energy. We're gonna go tackle this grand engineering challenge to build something nobody's built, to do something nobody's done yet. And I was like, I'm quitting my job, I'm taking a pay hit, let's try it, let's do it. I 
went totally red pilled on fusion basically did a self-directed phd i read all the books all the papers everything i could get my hands on and ultimately came up with this concept that we call the orbitron today and then started talking to vcs about this crazy idea to do small compact fusion in the pandemic from our home offices so it's tough if you look at a typical startup you want to start making revenue you want to see traction you want to see users and you're not going to see users in fusion the thesis of avalanche was very much borrowing from new space that we could do this rapid iterative test fail fix approach the goal of the seed was build an orbitron build a mostly electrostatically confined ion magnetically confined electron device and try and make some neutrons so we got into this warehouse with about 13 people and the very important point here is that we're not using multi-million dollar clean rooms and we're doing it with commercially available components. What enables us to be fast is that our setup is compact. If it was a room-sized fusion reactor, it wouldn't have taken years to go from a failure to another iteration. And we've been able to do that like 27 iterations within a year, which is amazing. In the space of two, three weeks, we can do a whole new reactor design. And we're able to kind of build the first machine, put it together in February, get it up to 50 to 80 kilovolts, it made fusion neutrons pretty much right off the go when we did deuterium. And that was enough to kind of show that we could go from nothing to building the first version of the Orbitron with $5 million or less. And that was what unlocked the Series A. You know, there was a huge like, yes, we've got Series A and holy crap, we got a lot of work to do. The Series A was really about like, okay, like you cobbled together this really janky thing that made a few neutrons. Now really take that and do some things that nobody has done before. The amount of voltage per volume, we've doubled that number. What that high voltage does is that it creates a field, or we call it electric stress, that traps the particles in a well in a way that they can collide with each other, produce fusion, and finally get us to the energy level that we want. And we need that at a very high level in a very compact fusion reactor size. Can we take the problem, break it down into some really key milestones, and then at the end, put it all together and do something no one has ever done before with electrostatic fusion. One of the milestones was 300 kilovolts. So we got to 300,000 volts through a lot of iteration, 20 odd different designs that were built and broken in a variety of different ways. Can you shoot more than a milliamp of ions in there? And then can you integrate superconducting magnets and put it all together? and hit a new plasma density 10 to 11 per centimeter cube that no electrostatic fusion device has ever been able to get up to. And then the idea was that once those things hit all their individual milestones, just like a rocket where the rocket engine hit the thing, the tanks hit the thing, now we're gonna put it all together and see if we can't set some new plasma density milestone to go try and really answer the question for the first time with a team of 50 people and tens of millions of dollars, not a million dollars, can, electrostatic approaches to fusion have a pathway to net energy. And that's what we're here today trying to prove. Last year, 2024, we were supposed to hit our density milestone we were shooting for. It was our last technical milestone for Series A. We had got to our milestone for voltage. We got to our milestone for beam injection, and we just weren't hitting our density milestone. So density is, we've got a fixed volume. Any more ions that you can pack in there that are doing fusion is gonna be more energy. Now, if I have a whole bunch of them, but they're cold, they're not gonna fuse. So I gotta have them hot, and I gotta have them dense. Now, if I only do it for a nanosecond, it's like, whoa, I got a lot of energy for a very short period of time. I gotta do it for a long period of time. So we gotta do all three of those things. And one of the big problems you have when getting it dense is instabilities. And what we were kind of seeing both in simulation and on the machines, is there's this plasma instability called a rotating mode. It's sort of analogous to like a washing machine where you put all your clothes in and they somehow all end up on one side and it's sort of rotating in a big clump and the whole machine is shaking. Well, we were seeing that happen with our plasma. And the problem with that is when that happens, you start losing all your particles to the wall so you can't build up a high density to do a lot of fusion. We knew there was a risk of plasma instabilities, right? All fusion machines often suffer from a plasma instability. So that was the thing that really limited us from pushing our plasma density higher. And that was problematic. Now I've got to figure out a way to kill this instability so I can get to my milestone. And no matter what we appear to do, we could not get it to settle down and densify. In fact, we don't even have a working fusion machine and a path to net energy. Stress, anxiety, what are we gonna do? I didn't know how we're gonna do it. 
April 2025, we're fighting through the realization that we are not gonna be able to stabilize it the way that we wanted to. And I didn't have a plan. That was sort of the beginning of a lot of like banging your head against the wall in terms of like, okay, what are we gonna do here? My PhD is in turbulence modeling. And one of the things I worked on in my PhD was called an explicit algebraic Reynolds stress model to model how turbulence was shed from the wing of an airplane, rolls up into the vortex at the tip. But if that vortex is rotating rotating in just the right way, the shear will rip apart the turbulence and stabilize it. And you'll end up with this really smooth laminar vortex coming off. It's called relaminarization in aerodynamics. And so, you know, this was a couple months ago. We were doing some experiments on our Marty machine where we were pulsing the cathode from zero to 100 kilovolts to try and understand how does this rotating mode start? Because maybe if we could understand how it starts, we could figure out how to prevent it from happening, right? And when we were doing that, we saw some very weird results that we didn't understand when we first saw them. And it took a couple weeks, but our plasma physicist, Eric, came to us on like Friday. I think by pulsing the cathode, we may have like spun up the plasma and done something that we have never done before and maybe helped stabilize it. And then at the same time, Jesus showed up and was like, do you know about these Russian experiments from the 1980s and 1990s, specifically this experiment called the PSP2? They pulse their cathode with a lot of current. By doing that, they're able to spin up their plasma really quickly and the shear from that spinning breaks up the mode and the turbulence. Uh, so basically I told them, look, you know, this is something that we need to look at because this is exactly what we're looking for. It was definitely a little bit of a light bulb moment. And looking at the current traces, you're like, you know, this matches this. By adding this, you know, rotational shear, we're able to really stabilize our plasmas. And that was like a big breath of oxygen. It was like, here's something to sink our teeth into. And so for me, that was like a, oh my God, I understand how that could work from my previous experience. And here is a experiment that actually demonstrated that in a plasma. The more I looked into the theory, the more papers I read, it's more than just that paper that Jesus found. It, it, it has been tried at national labs. It's been tried in different countries. I think we have the experimental basis, the theoretical basis to pivot to this thing and try and stabilize our rotating mode in our plasmas and see if we can't actually get to our plasma density of 10 to 11 and finish our Series A mouse cells. Now we were like, okay, let's put together the team, let's go build the machine that's gonna go do that. And so there was sort of this rush of like, okay, who's gonna be in charge? Eric's gonna be in charge. Who's gonna be, you know, the program manager working on it? Christine's gonna do that. I need this tool right here to tell us information for this higher magnetization. I need to have different end caps over here. We need to review our radius. It's always Friday that we're doing a reactor rebuild. We rebuild on Friday and then we have the whole weekend to bake it and have it ready to test on Monday. That pressure is what we're good at. This move to Jin is actually something we're used to. So it's named after Jin Erso, the character from Rogue One. Who are you? I'm Jin Erso. That stole the plans to the Death Star and saved the day. And so we're maybe stealing the plans from the Soviets to kind of save the day at the end. So I think there was a mix of both excitement over having a path, understanding our device better than ever before and understanding where it needs to go and also a lot of anxiety over the time frame that we had to be able to do it. There's new electrodes on the outside. There's new ways to be able to probe it and understand it. There was vibration that was throwing it off. We had to be able to tension portions of it to cut down on their vibration. That's the power of being able to iterate there. You may not be able to do everything you want, but that is the enemy of progress, is trying to do everything. I'd say since the start of Gen, there's been a lot of excitement. This is some really exciting physics that we're about to try. I am nervous, but I truly do believe that this is the best path forward. It's important to let a team wander. The path through the forest is sometimes unclear, and if you let a team wander, you may find a new clearing, a new meadow you didn't know that existed. I believe there is a path through here that there's a way to do this. 
Yeah, so today is the big push really is for, is for First Light, the defining experiment that's gonna get us to our end goals. It's sort of the culmination of the last four years of a lot of the things we've been doing. And so this is sort of like Avalanche Series A final exam. I asked the team to rally as a night, we're gonna try and do it. The ritualistic, nervous founder in me is like, what if it doesn't work? It's like Edison. Edison did how many tests on the ball? And somebody asked him, you've done this a thousand times and you failed a thousand times. What keeps you going? I said, no, it's not a failure. So you always learn something. Whatever happens, we will know. You know, what's the difference between a great scientist and a heretic? A great scientist tries to look at the assumptions, the basis, and see if there are cracks in the armor where some of those assumptions don't hold. Can you come to some new understanding or realization or enable something we didn't think was possible before, like an energy fusion machine? I'm nervous, I'm uh, excited, and so there should be a bright flash of light. And what that flash of light is, is the plasma ionizing. We're about to like take a small volume of gas and spin it up to a fraction of the speed of light. For a brief moment of time, that gas will probably be the hottest thing on the planet. It's like amazing that humans can even do this. A heretic is someone who hasn't found that chink in the armor, that crack, if you will, or hasn't been able to convince enough people that that chink exists. Right now, today, I think most people would call us fusion heretics, right? Trying to do electrostatic fusion. But I know that if we put the right people together. Three, two. We could change the world if that crack is big enough. One. I believe that we have to try to build those fusion systems that will enable that awesome science fiction future to happen. I hope people look back on what we did here, not just me, but us as a team. Resilience in the face of doubt. What chance do we have? The question is what choice? Believing in something and then working as hard as you can to make it real and never giving up. The time to fight is now. Every moment you waste is another step closer to the ashes of Jenna. And I can't think of anything that would be more impactful for the world for the better than to invent the ultimate form of energy and take us to the solar system and beyond. So they just turned off the microwave interferometer. We just showed that electrostatic approaches to fusion can get to like really high plasma densities. And that's really fucking exciting. I don't care about money. I don't care about fame. I want to see this future that I grew up with as a kid happen, and I want to see it happen in my lifetime. Your Highness, the transmission we received, what is it they've sent us? Help. Guys, hey, how have you been over the last month since the experiment? Um, you know, after we filmed that, so we had a chance to really dive into the data. And the number that came back from that night was about four E to the 12 per centimeter cube. So we blew past our Series A milestone by about 40X. And since then, we've been continuing to crank and iterate on the fusion machines. Like Friday, we did 52 tests. I and mean, you saw one. And then it's like really ramped up, get it more stable, figure out what's going on, and then you can increase rapidly. That's what's got me really excited. Is this looks like it transitioned from, you know, a science project with a science risk and instability to more of an engineering project that we can schedule out and run really quickly. And then we're going to start pushing up confinement time and voltage and energy and really start climbing the Fusion Triple Product chart.